All right. Are you guys getting a little bit more into Christmas? Yes. All right. I hope so. Uh, and getting the feel and the joy of Christmas. Let me open up with this reminder that Charles Spurgeon said, this is the season of the year, whether we wish it or not, we are compelled to think of the birth of Christ. Heavenly Father, you have prepared us for this hour, this time, this moment, Lord, all that we have gone through in our life in this year, this Christmas, God, it is a unique one. We've never had a Christmas 2023. And so, Lord, I just pray for a fresh infilling of your Holy Spirit upon all of us as we look at this season, the powerful promises. And Lord, I think so often you kind of laid on my heart today that we look at Christmas as a historical event, something of past that had impact, just like statehood or whatever it may be. But God, it's so much more. Christmas is not about past, it's about present and future. And so Lord, help me, all of us here together today, get this, grasp this, apply this into our lives, and that we will be your choir, Lord, singing these beautiful promises to a hurting and thirsty and needing world. So Lord, may I now and all of us decrease, you increase in us, let the words of my mouth, the meditations of our heart be right in your sight, my Father, my strength, Redeemer, and friend. Teach us now, Lord. Your kids are listening. And Father, if there are any who are just weary from the day, the week, whatever it may be, just give us that infilling right now to have just that precious, merry moment sitting at your feet. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay. All right. Well, as I mentioned before, Christmas time is this time that is an amazing opportunity for you and I to share the gospel, to evangelize, which is why I spend so much time each year teaching you a little bit more about the Christmas story and the elements that are within. One of the things we often talk about is the story, but we also this year are going to be looking at songs. And why do I look at the songs, the Christmas songs, and exegete them like I do a text? It's simply this. Songs have been a vital part of civilization. They have been responsible for movements, motivation, and memories. Music. Movements have been motivated, literally, through music. And so, obviously, you see that picture, and you have the classic example of what war? Okay, yeah, hopefully you guys went to history class, all right? So, you know, the American Revolution, and again, overwhelming numbers. And yet, here they came, and the spirit within. But when they heard that whistling, and that pipe, and that drum beat, they rose up to the occasion. It gave them strength and fervor, and not just alone in there. Here is a powerful picture from the Civil War. And when I saw this picture, I was like, oh man, I would have loved to have them for my company. You know what I mean? That was not going to be just some simple white guy playing a, you know, a bugle. These guys probably jammed, you know? And I was like, yeah, you know? But getting the people ready to face the attack, and of course, going straight to my roots, then you see this beautiful group right here, right in the middle of World War II. This is the 7th Division of the Scottish uh, Division during Battle of Normandy. Of the, they're called the Seaford Highlanders. And you got to say it, Highlanders? That's what they were. But you know, here's my people, and we're going into battle we are. But you hear the sound of the pipes, and you stand the streets, you does. <clears throat> and so, boom, and you just get that motivation and some of you recognize that as well. You're having a crazy cup of coffee day, and you put on some praise music. You hear it in the car in your house, and it does something. Are you with me? Music affects us. It's pretty much impossible to drive 55 listening to heavy metal. I've tried. It doesn't work. It just makes your foot heavier. And so this year, what we have been focusing on is, listen to my sentence, on what we have been proclaiming. This year, we are focusing on what we have been proclaiming year after year in our Christmas carols. We noted that the rest of the world has also been proclaiming and declaring these very same things that we have knowingly and unknowingly, and as I mentioned, majority unknowingly. We have learned that there is some serious beautiful, deep theology in many of these Christmas carols and others, they're more for fun or telling a story. Like, I got nothing on Frosty, okay? You know, there's nothing there or grandma getting run over a reindeer. There's nothing for me to teach here. 
Those are the fun ones that have just a, a silly part. But these deep and beautiful ones that have moved our hearts so much so that generation after generation, think of all the cultural changes that have happened in the world, but why these songs have stood the test of time, of what is being said and proclaimed in them. This year, our theme is what? Free gift. Free gift. I'm sorry, Christmas theme. All right. Our Christmas theme. Thank you. They're like, freedom. Okay. No, no. The, the Christmas theme is this free gift. And not just free gift, but the free gift of God is what? Eternal life in Christ Jesus. And so with that, I've been asking many of you, what is your favorite Christmas carol? It's just kind of talking to anybody that just comes up the question. And so many of you have given me those that are your, famous, your favorite Christmas carol. But as it came to my realization of this weekend, I thought to myself, since I have to do all the work, I'm going to do my favorite. And that is what we are going to look at. But first, before we get into my favorite Christmas carol, I want to share something really interesting. So take your Bibles with me now and go to the Old Testament, Numbers. Your Bible is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. We will get one to you because we are going to read right out of it tonight, today, a lot. Now, what we are going to look at in Numbers chapter 22, Numbers 22, we are going to be looking, and if you are new to Christianity, if you're new to this Bible and Bible stuff, you are going to hear with us a passage that we all agree is probably one of the trippiest passages in the entire Bible. I mean, it's definitely in the top five of where you just go, this is one of those like, huh? You know, totally trip out passages. It's the story of Balaam and his donkey, remember? So here we are, Numbers 22, 27, for those of you that have never heard it. It says this, when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam so that Balaam was angry and he struck the donkey with his stick and the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey. Please note that. I'm sure you already have that highlighted in this church. The Lord opened the mouth of the donkey and she said to Balaam, what have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? Then my favorite craziest part of the story is this. Then Balaam said, <laughs> you know, first of all, your donkey is doing this crazy thing, and all of a sudden the donkey talks to him, but now he's talking back to it. He's talking to the donkey. And then Balaam said to the donkey, because you have made a mockery of me, if there was a sword in my hand, I would have killed you by now. So three times, trying to protect him from the angel of the Lord with the drawn sword, he has diverted him to the path, and he's saying, I would have killed you because you're making a mockery, and that's why I'm beating you with a stick. You don't think talking to a donkey out loud that I'm sure the other guys didn't hear wasn't a mockery as well? I mean, this guy is totally just lost in this moment and his fixation on self. And then she says this, and the donkey said to Balaam, am I not your donkey on which you have ridden all your life to this day. Have I ever been accustomed to do so to you? And he said, no. Then, verse 31, the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand and he bowed all the way to the ground. So there's this powerful story. Why do I refer it here? Years ago, many years ago, I was at a Calvary pastor's conference. Don McClure was a man that I looked up to and respected, had an amazing Calvary Chapel ministry there uh, in, um, in Northern California by San Jose. And uh, he was teaching us at this conference, and then he began to tell us of a story. He was actually the son-in-law of Alan Redpath. So how amazing is that, to have the Redpath in your family? And so he was taking a walk with him at one time, his soon-to-be father-in-law, and he said, you know, sir, I'm really feeling like God is calling me into the ministry. I want to preach. I want to be like yourself. And Alan Redpath said to Don McClure, well, I guess the Lord spoke through a donkey before. I guess he can do it again. <laughs> now, just for the rest of you, this was so long ago, they were talking King James language. Okay, let that sink through if you understand what I'm saying here. And the point of the story is he was bringing that to all of us in the humility of the fact that he was expecting him to go, oh, that's great, you know, right? But he was just like saying, don't get too up on yourself. Don't take yourself too seriously. And so definitely one of the reasons why I myself do not put a whole lot of uh, clout, I should say, into accolades. Now, 
I hear somebody out here already saying, wait, how come we're in this crazy donkey story? What does this have to do with Christmas? Or how is he going to tie this in? O oh, ye of little faith. I will do so. Now, in the case with Joy to the World and other Christmas carols we're going to see and study, those were written by theologians who were using this opportunity, this great, incredible biblical event to convey to the world what had happened and the sanctification and the salvation. However, the song that we are going to look at today, this weekend, is one of the most sacred, one of the most beloved songs in the church. It was, in fact, family, written by three absolutely non-biblical persons. I'm saying non-Christians, non-churchgoers, they would not be here this weekend at our services, the ones who wrote this song. Who were they? Well, let me show you first of all. The original writer of the song that we have today, he was a French liberal politician and a wine merchant. He was also a poet, and his name was, and I'm going to destroy the French, Placid Capel. So that's the best I could do. Then the music was written by a composer of the French National Opera. This composer was an atheistic Jew. So now we have an atheist Jew who wrote the music that we will sing today as we sing this song by the name of Adolf Adam. And then it was translated from the French version to the version that we sing today. And this came from a broke and frustrated Unitarian minister who lived on a commune. And his name was John Sullivan Dwight. See, the thing that's so amazing is here you have these three unholy trinity, quote unquote, and the song that you and I are going to look at has probably more scripture in it than the majority of songs that we sing. It's amazing. It's called God. Amen? So here's the background for you. This is it. This, the, the story behind the story. The little town of Rochmar had recently fixed up the 17th century organ in the parish church. According to most accounts, the parish priest requested for a Christmas debut, a song from the local poet, mayor, and wine merchant, Placide Capot. At the time, there was residing in the town a soprano, Emily Laure, a friend of the renowned composer, Adolphe Adam, who agreed to write music expressly for her to perform this new canticle of Christmas. And she did in the church of St. Jean Baptiste at the Christmas Midnight Mass on 1847. This song, first time sung, 1847. From this, as I mentioned, very unholy trinity came the song that you know as O Holy Night. Interesting. This may throw some of you off. Wait a minute, this song, in fact, this song, once it was found out that who the persons were writing it, many of the churches rejected it for quite a long time because it was written by people who weren't even believers for crying out loud. This may throw you off that it was written by a non-believer until you and I remember that God can speak through a donkey. <laughs> donkey. <laughs> and in the morning, I'm making waffles. Mm. Donkey. God can speak through a donkey. That means God can speak through anybody or anything. Amen? Amen? Nothing is off limits for God to use to show his glory. He's God. So you might even be surprised, some of you in here, this is a little side note, but for more for a later message, that Balaam, this Balaam story, it's actually not just being used to emphasize that God can speak through anyone. Did you know that a critical part of the Christmas prophecy and the Christmas story came from Balaam? If you have your Bible still open, now go to 24, Numbers 24, and take a look at this, and then you will begin to recognize this yourself as well. Numbers 24, find me at verse 16. The oracle of him, remember he was told to prophesy, and he was supposed to put curses on, but instead God spoke through him and he spoke his words over the nation and over Balak. And he says this, the oracle of him who hears the word of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty falling down, yet his eyes uncovered. Look at verse 17. 
I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. What's it say next? A star shall come forth from Jacob. A scepter shall rise from Israel and shall crush through the forehead of Moab and tear down all the sons of Seth. We saw last week the very call of the curse when sin came to earth in the garden and he spoke about a heel being bruised and a mortal wound to the head. Moab, as we've seen, has symbolically become known as, as actually evil. The toilet bowl was the reference that it came to in the muck. And so you got Egypt bondage, Moab sin. And you begin to see this prophecy coming forth. First of all, it talks about a star and we're gonna see there's a double reference to star, what that means in regarding to a star. But then when it says a scepter, who holds a scepter? A king. And so the very prophecy of this special one from the line of Jacob, this king, is going to be coming. Now, as I mentioned, there were the three original versions that came out. You're not going to be able to see this, but I just want you to see the context of it, of how it flowed. So you got on the far left, his original poem, and then when it was put into a literal translation, and then it was moved by John Sullivan when he took it and translated it through, and that is the version that you see on the right-hand side that we will look at from the original writings of the person who wrote it through and then its translation. Now, before I go any further on this, I got something that I want to say. You're like, yeah, when don't you? Okay. If you picked up with what I'm saying, I told you that this song was written by three people that actually didn't go to church. And we're going to see such amazing, rich, and deep theology. Now, I do believe and know for a fact, Myola can as well, believe in the, the uh, when God comes upon us and his incarnate word comes upon us and we are saying things that God gives to us. Sometimes when we're preaching, we want to take notes on ourselves because it wasn't there. The Lord's just speaking it. And so we've spoken about that with the writers. But I want you to also know something, church. Listen to me. This is a clear documentation that Christmas was working. Let me explain. When we've gone through this study every year on regarding where that came from, Christmas, we talked about all the different things, the name, Christ Mass. But then we talked about the 24th, as those groups want to come around and say to you, well, you know there was actually a pagan thing, so it's a pagan festival and blah, blah, blah. And we discussed that, yes, the church itself because there was a pagan festival for the longest of time called the winter solstice, where they would gather together in pagan activities to celebrate the birth of the sun, the S-U-N, the heads, the leadership of the church at that time said, hey, why don't we overshadow this with something much more worthy of worshiping, the birth of the S-O-N, sun? And so the people have already been in a custom of wanting to celebrate at this time. We're seeing this birth of Christianity and it's growing and it's moving. So why don't we make this holiday about something it should be about? My point is, there was so much about Christmas being about Jesus and his coming and his birth that the general populace had such an incredible knowledge of the story. Are you hearing me? Nobody was walking around going, well, I, why are we celebrating it now? It's been this whole attack that's come back in the last 20 years of saying, you know, you shouldn't be doing this in the tree and all this nonsense. And I talk about that in the other message. But I just, when I was looking at this, I was like, wow, here's it showing that Christmas was working. Here's three people who didn't go to church, but they at least knew the story. Today, we're in a world where I'm not even sure they have that. Are you with me? Okay. So let's now take a look at this song. Oh, holy night. And let's see what God wanted the world to know. What did he bring through these people, and especially the writer and the translator, that God wanted the world to know, even through Josh Groban, Nat King Cole, and the rest. And here's the last thing. My prayer for you is this. As I was meditating on this message today, the Lord just said this to me. Help my kids understand that this song and the celebration of Christmas is not about the past. 
This song that we're going to look at, Christmas itself, is not a celebration of a historical event. It's a declaration of a present gift in motion. Amen? We are declaring something when we talk about Christmas. Not just this thing that happened there and then, but because of it. That's the song. It is a declaration, and I pray that you will leave, and uh, when you sing this song later today, and as you sing the others on the radio, you will hear in your heart, as I challenged last week, joy to the world. The Lord has come. No, the Lord is come. And we spoke about that. You there? Okay. First line. Oh, holy night. The stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear, what? Savior's birth. All right, the word holy, again, what does it mean? A sacred place or thing, something that's consecrated, meaning set apart, something that is dedicated, a hallowed, where we get the hallowed be thy name, a holiness, saint or a sanctuary. These are the uses of this word. It's 611 times in the Bible through 544 verses. One thing we do need to know for sure out of all this, and that is this. It is God that makes something holy. Amen? It's God that makes something holy. Wherever God is, it becomes holy because where he is, he makes it holy. And how do I even know that? Well, what was the very first mention of the use of the word holy in the Bible? Well, it's actually Moses at the bush. And notice what he says to him in Exodus 3, 5. Look overhead. Then he said, do not come near here. Remove your what? Sandals. See, biblical proof, God's preferred footwear. <laughs> slip -offs. You guys can't argue with me. I'm showing you biblical facts, just like last week. All right. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place in which you are standing is what? Holy ground. It was the Sinai Desert. But wherever he is, he makes it holy. Now, stars... Stars, we know, they shine every single night, but this night was different. There was a light that was so bright that it made the other stars reflect it even brighter. Hmm, it is the night. What was so different about this night? It was the night of our dear Savior's birth. The other stars reflected so brightly. And then that made me think about what happens in Exodus 34, where we hear the story of what happened to Moses that Moses would continually go back up to the mountain. And whenever he spent time with God, what happened to him? What happened to his face? He would glow. He would glow in such a way that he would have to put a veil because the people were like, dude, you're a little too bright to look at. Because he was in the presence of the Lord. What is my point? That the very beginning of this song begins to speak about this bright and this light. And I want us to know that you and I, we too, we can shine in the dark because of this night we are talking about. What happened here? We can come before his presence and worship. Why? Because it was the night of our, yours and mine, Savior's birth. Amen? So that's the first thing that I have to reflect. If God never gave me another thing more, he's already given me more than I deserve. Hit here, salvation. Then he goes on to say, Long lay the world in sin and error pining. Seemingly last week we talked about as far as the curse is found. The point, since the fall in the garden, humanity has suffered the consequences of sin. You know that it's such a sad commentary that in Noah's Ark, where God was wiping out all of the destruction and sinful behavior in the world, that in chapter 9 we get when Noah's family comes out of the ark. Do you realize that the first mention of their sin is in chapter 9? The very people, as they get out of the ark, we don't get past the chapter before we see it was still sinners in the boat and sinners got out of the boat, amen? And so we see that God does his saving work not because of our worth, but because of his worth and his purpose and his plan. Now, once again, what are we seeing here? The song is reminding us why we need a savior. Why do we need a savior? Because the wage of sin is, but the free gift of God is, Eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Are you, are you tracking with me here now? You see where I'm going? Okay, good. Then check this next line. Till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. Pew. Wow. Do you guys understand what you just said? Till he appeared and the soul felt 
its worth. I could clear out the insane asylums. I could clear out much of the prisons. I could clear out much of the clinical psychological wards if people understood this sentence and what's happening right here. I mean, gosh, the soul, when all of a sudden he appeared, the soul felt its worth. Nothing makes us more aware of our imperfection than being in the presence of perfection, right? I mean, I've talked about that so many times here. Made all the jokes about it, that, you know, you see a beautiful woman, and she's just totally thin, and perfect hair, panting hair, and it's flowing, and she's eating a three-stacked ice cream cone, and ladies, you look at her and go, hate her. <laughs> You're not too different, guys. You will come on the beach, you're chilling out there, and that guy comes up, and he's got the six-pack, and you got the chips. <laughs> he's got the brick, you got the mortar. You're like, oh, too much sun, I need to put my shirt on. No, no, no. When we see something, it makes us aware. So what's my point? The soul felt its worth. Please listen and jot this down. It was a twofold. First, the soul felt its worth in conviction. They saw this holy plan from the holy, divine God, the King of kings. And so all of a sudden, we are aware of our own need and in our worthlessness, meaning there's nothing that I could do to make myself righteous. But then what we're gonna see in the song, the soul felt its worth, is that it then immediately becomes overwhelmed at the awe of such love. You see, that's what I challenged you last week that many are missing. If you don't really understand your depravity, then you don't really understand the depths of what has been given to you freely, amen? Gratitude comes when you grasp. And so when I first see his holiness, the writer is saying, I am immediately in awe of my own imperfection, and that makes even all the more the awe that God would do so much and give to us himself. So much so, the next line says, a thrill of hope. The weary world rejoices. I mean, talk about a gift. If there's a gift this world needs, that's hope. And the song says that when we have hope, true hope that's focused on Jesus Christ, what does it do? It creates a thrill. Now, just think about that for a second. Is that what your Christianity is doing for you? Or is it still just a moral code? Something that I keep because it says to do so and I want to go to heaven. I mean, do I see at church? So often a comment will be made to me and I appreciate it when they say, man, we love your passion and your fervor. And in my heart, I just want to, yeah, doesn't everybody? Doesn't everybody? The thrill of hope. Why? Because my soul felt its worth and regardless of how little I had to give to him, God gave everything to me freely. That's Christianity, not churchianity. And you see, the thing we need to recognize is that hope is the key word here. We are going to be doing an outreach later this year in 24, specifically to the military, because we have been given statistics lately about the incredible amount of suicides going on right now with a lot of our military. And it's just devastating. And you see, people only take their life when they feel hopeless. And you and I have been given the free gift of hope. And I hope that that gift doesn't stay just with us. Amen. And that is my passion through this message and this season. Notice what it says next. For yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Okay. Typical surfer doesn't use the word yonder. But what's coming after. So you see the things. We see him, the stars, all that is there. The heart recognizes. He appeared. We felt the worth, a thrill of hope. And then why? For yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. What is this about? Well, it's not just that in the morning the people would see that there was born a baby Jesus. No, no, no. In that morn, it means so much more biblically. Look overhead. Psalm 30, verse 5. For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. You hear me quote in this church all the time, Lamentations 3. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, and his mercy is new every morning. Okay, church, look at this. His anger is but for a moment. 
Okay, I'm talking about how people have made God sound like this God you don't want to be because he's out this cosmic cop with his holy radar gun to bust you. Huh, well, his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for what? A lifetime. Weeping may last for the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. What is the thing that God leaves us with? When you have hope, you look forward to what comes next. What a beautiful gift. When one has hope restored, such joy, such elation, they do something. When you're so overwhelmed with what you have been giving and your worth, you do the next thing. Fall on your knees. Oh, hear the angel voices. Oh, night, what night? Divine. Oh, night, what made it divine? When Christ, Christos means what? Savior was born. Oh, this night that was divine because the Savior was born. But what did they do? They fell on their knees. And I've often encouraged you, church, please, somewhere at some time in your home, fall on your knees and pray. It will be a different prayer. Somehow ourselves, physiologically, it has a sense of our, our Maybe since our sense of our value and our worth. And too often we're standing before God with almost that when I get to him, I'm going to ask him why he hasn't done this or why hasn't God done that. And there's this sense of eye to eye or equal in entitlement. And that's when people get frustrated because the key to frustration is unmet expectation. So we expect that God should do this. Oh, if I started with the sin, I started with the consequence of sin. I understand who his great love is and what he had to do in order to become one of us to then take that brutal life and then brutal time on the cross for me. There's a very silly line in a movie that I will not highly recommend, but it did just pop into my head, so I will say it. Wayne's World. (laughs) And as soon as he sees a rock star that he has totally looked up to, he falls down and goes, we're not worthy, we're not worthy. Interesting. Interesting towards a human being. My point, hear this in love, it's Christmas, I'm trying to to, to work and massage things, but the gospel comforts the afflicted and it afflicts the comfortable. If perhaps you have not been drawn to such a knee-dropping awe, it may be perhaps because you have not been sincerely staring in the face of God. May I encourage you to have a merry Christmas, not a Martha Christmas. Staring at his face. You see, the point is this. Once we have these things, we fall on our knees, the angel voices. I wanted you to see something. It says, O night divine, when Christ was born. Divine, meaning God, Christ. So once again, we have in the same context, the same text, telling us that Jesus is God. It was him that came that made it divine. But now, we get to the next verse. And here's the interesting thing that I've spoken to about in all these Christmas carols. There always seems to be this omitted verse. And sure enough, this song has the most, and the reason why I showed you that slide of the three, I wanted you to see it was in the original writing by the original poet and then the original translation. It was there, the fullness of it. I spent over a half hour looking all over the web to find someone who actually had this verse in their rendition of O Holy Night, and I didn't find one. And of course, when you see this verse, you are going to see how much it rocks and why I'm going to geek out all over it again. Because it's so good. First first line, led by the light of faith, serenely beaming with glowing hearts by his cradle, we stand. See what I mean? Look at that right out the gate. Led by the light of faith. Now, you know I could go for hours on just that. Faith, the currency of heaven. Think how many verses you know of in the Bible that are referencing faith. Here we understand that the children of Israel were what? They were led through the wilderness by what? A light, by the light. And same light that you and I can have, that we can have faith in that light. So we will have, hear me, faith to take that next step. The faith that knows that that light is going to shine before me, then that gives me the faith that I need to take the next step. It's such a powerful thing. Why? Why do I know this? Why do we bank on this? 
1 John 1, 5, it says this, and this is the message that we heard from him and announced to you that what? God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If today you are feeling you're in the dark, not sure what's going on in 2024, have a lot of fears and reservations about whether I should do this or do that. Well, it says that God is light. The song is saying led by the light of faith and it's serenely beaming. It's out there with glowing hearts. Hmm, we stand. What do, what do I mean by that? Well, you see, in John 8, 12, Jesus said to them, I am the light of the world. So we know in 1 John, it says God is light. Now the same author writes in, in, in recording Jesus saying, I am the light. So if God says he's light and Jesus says he's light, then Jesus is God. And so he's saying, I am the light in this world, in this path. And it's led by the light of faith that is serenely beaming. But basically, let me ask you this question. If God has given us such a light, we have the privilege to stand in front of that light so that then our own lives begin to be a light we begin to reflect like Moses. Are you and I going to take this light and hide it under a bushel? No. no. Remember the song. Most of you don't even know this, but for literally 30 years, every sermon I ended with that sentence. Today we've learned that are you going to take this truth and hide it under a bushel? But I, after my body gave out on me and I wasn't coming out after services, then I lost that privilege of doing so. But I want you to check the second line with me. It says, with glowing hearts, by his cradle, we stand. Let me see if this registers for you. By following the light to Jesus, they became one. Did that sink in? With glowing hearts. You see, church, as you and I follow the light, then you and I become one to others. You know what I'm talking about. You've had coworkers, friends that have said, man, I've been watching you and how you dealt with COVID, how you dealt with this and how you dealt with that. And it's caused me to rethink what I've thought about God or Christianity or the Bible, et cetera. You know what I'm talking about? You see, by following the light, then you and I become one because we can take this step of faith. And oh, by the way, is that scriptural? 100%. Matthew 5, 14, Jesus not only said that he's the light, he says, you are the light of the world. Amen? That's us, and that's where we are. Next line. So, led by light of a star sweetly gleaming, here come the wise men from the Orient land. What's my first thought? Once again, it says that God shows no partiality. Jesus says, God so loves the world. The world, God has always from the very beginning had a desire for all peoples. But you will still hear someone out there who is basically a nimrod in their information and think that Christianity is a Western religion for white people. I'm like, you know where this started, right? This is no gender, this is no race religion, this is God. And God is of all people. And who is this God? that all of even these folks from the Orient, that God had made sure that even they had an invitation to this glorious time of the king being born? Well, it is just that. The next line says, the king of kings lay thus in a lowly manger. Okay, they're talking about, they're all being drawn, all peoples, and they're glowing themselves as they follow this light. But it says the king of kings lay in this lowly manger. Church, who we worship is critical. Hmm, that's one of those points that I just said that, you know, it's kind of like a doink. Who we worship is critical. Now, I'm going to guess on this busy weekend, Christmas season, all tons of reasons to stay home. I noticed even today a little bit less in, in, in the house because of the marathon, and people are just like, yeah, no, thank you. I'm going to stay away from the crowds. But when you begin to begin to realize something of the king of kings and the gift of who he is. Oh my gosh, I totally lost my thought right there. Apologize for that. Who we worship, oh, thank you, Lord. Who we worship is critical. And you see, 
there's a lot of folks here, a lot of you watching us online, maybe some of you, forgive me for being so direct, but maybe you still haven't come outdoors since COVID. You're still concerned about coming around and being around peoples and such. You may have some preconditions that would make yourself more vulnerable. My point to all of us is this, if you know who it is, I'm not saying his name. Oh yeah, of course it's Yeshua. Now do you know who it is, who this King of King is? All that is described in who God is, this one who is large and in charge, who is the lover, the giver, the forgiver. Are you tracking where I'm going? You see, when you know him, people say, oh, I believe in Jesus. Like, great, me too, which one? Do you believe in the God of the Bible? Do you understand what is the relationship of who is inviting you and I to have breakfast together? Oh my gosh. And so who we worship, it's critical, and it's such a powerful verse. It's the king of kings, but you see in this line, it shows why they are in such awe of the humility that here in front of them, they were given a gift of the king of kings to become one of us. And so it's like, wow, here you are the almighty God, the incarnate right here, the Trinity is one in this song written by secular people, and it's saying, we're blown away that God would do such a thing as become one of us. Do you know how much you're loved? I don't know right now by your faces whether you're looking at me because it's penetrating or you're asleep or whether you're blocked or, but you see, I'm hoping that it'll start to go like this. When you begin to realize, man, I am loved. I don't need no Hallmark story to tell me that. Such a gift. But this next line, church, this is amazing that is in this song. This next line is missed by the masses, not meaning that they don't sing it. I'm saying the very truth that it is proclaiming is missed by the majority of people in this world, including a predominance of Christianity, in my opinion. It says this, in all our trials, born to be our friend. Listen, this is the chorus. The king of kings lay thus in lowly manger, in all our trials, born to be our, what? Our friend. Yes, he is master. Yes, he is savior. But he says these things in John 3. John told us, for God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be, what? Saved through him. But Jesus' own words describing himself is this, John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his Hey, he could have said subjects, his creation, all these different things. What does God call you? Friend. Remember I told you a couple weeks ago how powerful that is? Because God not only loves you, he likes you. And we all know there's people we love, but we don't necessarily like. <laughs> Jesus calls you friend. You me, imperfect human beings, that the angels must be knocking their heads going, why does he put up with this? Why? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? And you see, he calls us friends. And why? Why in all of our trials, born to be our friend, verse, the next line, he knows our need to our weakness, no stranger. What a beautiful, he is clearly quoting right from Hebrews 4.15 if he doesn't even know it. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. But then it says what? But one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. You know when you start telling somebody, man, this is what I feel, and this is what I'm going through, and they say, yeah, I understand exactly. I've been there and I've experienced that. What a connection you have with that person. Are you hearing me? The Bible's letting us know that Jesus was not some Clark Kent where all emotions and things bounced off of him. It says he was tempted like us in all things. Little newsflash, if you don't want it, it's not a temptation. Raise your hand if you've ever been tempted to hit your head with a two by four. Okay. You see, if he was tempted like us, then the very things that you and I have struggled with, our wants and our thoughts and all of these things, he took on and yet he was able, the scriptures tell us, to respond to these temptations because temptation is not a sin. It's what you do with it, right? And he did so without sin. He went to the strength of Father and his word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I 
sin not against you. And so once again, now the line ends, it says, behold your king before him lowly stand. Again, an acknowledgement, Psalm 95 and the many other that say, come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Dear one, can I just encourage you again, the lower you get, the more amazing your God becomes. It truly does. And for me, the physical act does something for me. It breaks my need of people coming to me for answers and such. I'm able to say, Papa, I can't even give them squat if I don't have you first. First and foremost. Now we go back to the last line that everyone does know. Truly, he taught us to love one another. His law is what? Is love. His law is love. And his gospel is? Now that doesn't sound like how Jesus is PR, you know, the PR of Jesus right now. That's not kind of what CNN guys are, you know, putting out there. His law is love. See, church, if only his church, would, if, we, if we would just start right here with that line, what a wonderful world this would be. Jesus, God the Father, loves the world, and we are told to do so as well. John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, not a new suggestion, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Oh, the scary line is, even as I have. There's a certain depth and genuineness when Jesus says, this is how I love, I want you to love. Remember Romans 13, 8, owe nothing to anyone except to what? Love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Mm, what law? His law is love, and his gospel is peace. And of course, I could go on and on regarding this command of God. But eyes this way for a second. This is the time for me to remind you a sentence I say all the time. God's commandments are his enablements. Obviously, I don't say it enough because you didn't have it. <laughs> Maybe I need to repeat it more. God's commandments are his enablements. What do you mean, Wax? Well, when he said to the guy with the withered hand, stretch forth your hand, the guy didn't go, uh, dude, it's withered. When God gave the command, he also gave the power for it to go. When he told the man to stand up in the command, was the power. So when God gives a command, in that command, he also gives the power for the fulfillment of that. If not, that would be cruel for me to tell a blind guy, hey, look over there. If I didn't have the power to cause him to see, are you tracking with me? So when God says, be pure, keep yourselves pure before marriage, it's not something that you gotta do. Let God do it. If he's going to ask that of you and me, he's going to give us the power. Are we going to the source of the command and recognizing that no matter what God has asked of us, he asked us to do it with him. My wife is very social. She's the extrovert. I'm the introvert. She hates going grocery shopping by herself. But if she has someone to go with her, it's a whole different experience. She loves doing things with people. And all I do is walk around on the cart. Not really all that much of a support, but I am with her. Can you imagine? God is saying, I want to be with you today. So whatever you do, let's do it together. And yet here we are trying to strive. Oh, pastor, Christianity is so hard, man. Because we're not recognizing that who is with us, that we can at any moment say, Father, help, and understand that I have been given the authority and the power to live it. Why, why, why am I taking these five minutes to explain this? Because church, when God calls us to love this world, we don't have to fake it. He can give you the real love. Lord, this person is so unlovable right now for me. I am struggling here. But God, I need you to give me your love, 
your grace. And what happens is that then in those kinds of prayers, the Lord brings the revelation of your own neediness and your own activity that needed the blood of Jesus Christ. And you recognize there, but by the grace of God go I. I happen to have the Lord, so he has given me this understanding. They may not, sometimes they are believers, but they may not. And all of a sudden, I have this true love of empathy and care for that person. And I can testify to that over and over in my own testimony. Any amens are there? Anybody? Yeah. If there's a person, especially in this family season of gathering together that you need to reconcile, God can do it. You don't need to fake it. God will give you the love and you'll just be like, I don't know what happened, but I love you all of a sudden. <laughs> don't do anything to ruin it. Just kidding. Last couple lines here. You guys still with me here? Okay. Chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother. What is that all about? Isaiah 53, the great prophecy. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us, all of us, each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity, what? Of us all to fall on him. The slave is our brother. That means all of us. As I just mentioned, if that individual, God gives me the love when I recognize that I too am a sinner. I too need forgiveness. But what did Jesus Christ say his mission statement was? The whole world got all into mission statements 25 years ago. Well, what did Jesus say his was? Super clear. He quotes Isaiah 61 in Luke 4. And this is what he says. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me, my mission statement, to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim Release to whom? Captives, chains shall he break. And recovery of sight to the blind to set free those who are what? Oppressed. What's the next line of the song? And in his name all oppression shall cease. See, when God begins to break the chains, the bond is that I feel the connection to my past. And so many of you are born again Christians, still being identified by your past, still sensing value by your past. And that is not biblical Christianity. He sets you free, not just from the effect and the cause, but also the shame and the thought and the sense of value. None of you are a I did, you are a I am in Christ Jesus. That is a powerful truth and to live our lives. And so, all oppression sell sheep. What do we know by this? And in his name. What do we know about his name? Philippians 2 says, so at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, those who are in heaven and those who are under earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, when we understand the one in that name, all oppression will cease because in that day, he will remove all the suffering. Last line is this, sweet hymns of joy, in grateful chorus raise we. Let all within us praise his holy name. I've been speaking about what this song is talking about, is this incredible gift that God, the King of Kings, would choose to become one of us and not only just come be among us, but forgive us and have a set aside for a purpose for us and a value for our present and our future. Well, what happens when somebody gives you an amazing gift? What is your natural response? Gratitude, gratefulness, correct? They're like, whoa, wow, I can't believe you did this. And then the next line is, I didn't get you anything. <laughs> and you're just like, whoa. Well, that's what it says. That's what it's talking about. When we get this incredible gift of God, from Genesis to Revelation, you and I are called to and shown why we are to praise him. Because when we realize what God has done, the natural response is this simple joy of a grateful choir. Let us raise it to him. Let all that is within us praise his name. The Bible even teaches, family, that when we worship God, that in act, the actual act is not for him. God does not need my worship. I need to worship him. If you don't know what I'm talking about, figure out why you started to feel better when you started listening to praise music. Because now your attention went off the false God, yourself. And your attention went to the true God, who is of full value, who we can trust. Amen? That's what it said, the light and faith before us. You see, the bigger 
the, the more I focus on my Lord, the bigger he becomes and the smaller my issues become. And so this song says, let all that is within me praise his name. Where did he get this? Well, whether he knew it or not, he was quoting Psalm 103, which says, verse one, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his, what? Holy name. Church, think about the depth. You know, I challenged you last week, what is God doing in your life? And I said, the answer is whatever you've been asking him to, whatever you've been giving him permission to, whatever you have been emptying out so that he can fill, that's the room that God needs to work what we give to him. And in the same way, all that is within me, bless his holy name. You see, if we're just singing the songs, if we're just keeping it here, we're gonna have only this much of an experience. But if we understand all that I have, it's all from you and all that is within me, I wanna bless you, Lord, with my time, my talent, my treasures, my joy, my eyes, when I see things, thank you, thank you, Lord, that's so incredible. It enhances your worship and your relationship with Father. Just telling you straight out. Because the next line is, Christ is the Lord, oh, praise his name on Sundays. Oh, when? Mm. Praise his name forever. His power and glory evermore proclaim. What I found most interesting in this song was this. Even though this verse is included on most manuscripts of the song, it isn't completed. You may realize this or not, but I looked over for a half hour, like I said, and Third Day was the only band that completed this chorus, this line. Why? Because almost all of them say, Christ is the Lord, oh, praise his name forever. And then you know what? They say, Noel, Noel, oh, night when Christ was born. Why did we go to Noel? It's right here in print. His power and glory evermore do what? Proclaim. See, Noel, it means born, was born. Once it got to the 14th century, coming from the Latin word, then it became exclusively recognized as the birth of Christ. So the one born first, that value we know of firstborn. But the word literally means to be born. And what happens is this song is saying all that we've just spoken about, his power and his glory evermore proclaim. You see, first off is this. If Christ is the Lord, we've already seen that every tongue will confess that he is Lord. But then praise his name forever, it reminds us of something. Acts 4 says this. There is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven that has been given among us by which we must be what? Saved. See, oh, praise his name name, the name of Jesus, church. I've often challenged people who just say Christ or the Lord. You know, he has a name. God becomes more personal when you begin to use a name. That's why he gave us a name to use, Jesus, the sweetest name. Hey, what'd you do this morning? I was talking to Jesus. Or I was doing my devotions. the presence. Jesus. He's my friend. He's my maker, my savior, redeemer. That name, Jesus, has the power to raise people from the dead, to cast out demons. That name of Jesus. There is no salvation. Peter said, it's at the name of Jesus and no other name. So the first part that he is the Lord is praise his name, but power and glory evermore proclaim. Well, my thoughts went to 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. When? Until he comes. Forevermore, it's calling us to. Church, there's nothing more powerful and more beautiful than the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for you and me. Communion is not a thing, it's an action. You commune with someone. I'm communing with you today. And because of Emmanuel, remember a couple years ago I taught you, Emmanuel literally means with us is God. We translate it God with us, but in the order in Hebrew, with us is God. Because God is with us, we get the gift to commune with God. So because of that precious, oh, holy night 2,000 years ago and that finished work on the cross to pay that price for your sin and mine, you and I are invited to have a night divine for the rest of our lives. 
Yeah, amen to that. Hallelujah to that. Talk about an amazing free gift to have a night divine the rest of our lives. My point in this sermon is this. God used three very unlikely folks to tell the world of his love. Just think what he can do and wants to do through you. The authors of this song show that we can have the words, but not the heart. I pray that's not you. The song is doctrinally sound, but as far as we know, we will not see these persons in glory unless something happened. We can have the words, church, but do we have the heart? This attitude of gratitude, an atmosphere blown away in awe. My soul felt its worth. God loved me. God loves me and sees me as his precious child. This is the season of the year, whether we wish it or not, we are compelled to think of the birth of Christ, Savior. And songs have been a vital part of civilization. They have been responsible for movements, motivations, memories, and evangelism. Evangelism, church, what an amazing gift that we have been given, but isn't it also an amazing gift we can give? Amen. Let's sing it this Christmas. Not just on the radio, but the way we act in line. How we care for our neighbor. How we step out. Let's give the gift of a holy night that transformed our eternity forever. Amen. Aloha, I'm Gordon, and I'm the director of children's ministry here at One Love. And I want to say thank you for tuning in today. We hope that you are inspired and strengthened by today's celebration. If you're new to One Love, we encourage you to visit us online at onelove.org and fill out a connect card so we can keep you up to date with all the things that are happening here. While you're there, you can also learn more about One Love, submit prayer requests, or see more of our studies through the Bible. There are many ways to stay connected, so we encourage you to take that first step. If you're watching today's celebration via YouTube, we encourage you to subscribe to our channel and click that bell icon to keep informed with new messages. Most importantly, if you made a decision to follow Christ today, we encourage you to click on the I Said Yes to Christ link at the bottom of our website and fill the form so we can stay connected. One last thing, if you want to learn more about the good news of Jesus Christ, we encourage you to visit goodnewshawaii.com. There, you'll find five short videos about living a life in Christ and a free discipleship booklet designed to encourage your new faith. Mahalo for tuning in to One Love today. We hope you were blessed by our time together. Aloha.